Our next chapter, chapter 16, is on non-renewable resources. Non-renewable resources are also referred to as exhaustible resources. Now, renewable resources like fisheries could, in theory, be exhausted. They could be driven to extinction. And so you, you could think of renewable resources as also being potentially exhaustible. But traditionally, when economists use the term exhaustible resources, they mean non-renewable resources, resources like copper and petroleum. Whose, whose current size is fixed. Now, it is clear that the same geological processes that resulted in concentrations of, let's say, copper, nickel, and particular uh, areas of the Earth's crust, those geological processes are continuing. And so you could think that if we wait a few tens of millions of years, we might have more copper or more higher quality copper deposits. But on human time scales of much less than a million years, the stock of, let's say, copper of a particular quality is fixed. We don't know where all those stocks are, but the stocks themselves are fixed. We're going to start by discussing three main attitudes towards exhaustible resources, uh, named Malthusian, Ricardian, and Cornucopian. And these are basically different attitudes about the answer to the question, how much should we be worried about the fact that we're, our economy is dependent on exhaustible resources? The first uh, group of people that we're going to discuss are the Malthusians. The Malthusian school is named after Robert Thomas Malthus, who was an English economist working in the early 1800s, so the generation just after Adam Smith. Malthus wasn't explicitly talking about exhaustible resources. He was talking about the food supply, and he was worried about the following problem. He thought that the population of a country like England, his own country, would grow ge what he called geometrically like the numbers 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Whereas he thought that the supply of food would grow, but it would grow what he called arithmetically, like the numbers 2, 4, 6, 8, uh, and 10. And since population grew, um, since population grew geometrically and food supply grew arithmetically, you could eventually run into a problem with not enough food to supply the, the population. And he was quite worried about this. He worried that there would be a great famine that would bring the size of the population down to the number of people that could be currently fed. And in order to avoid the famine, his policy recommendation was to increase the age of marriage. So people would have to be older when they got married, and therefore they'd have kids when they were older, and this would decrease the rate of population growth. Uh, now, it's rather interesting that Malthus had an effect on Charles Darwin. So Malthus was writing roughly before 1820. Darwin was getting his first ideas about uh, Charles Darwin was getting his first ideas about evolution that became the theory of evolution uh, shortly after that, and, and Darwin had read Malthus. So the Malthusian ideas that population is limited by the food supply, that in some sense there's a survival of the fittest question, seem rather natural to us, but that's because we got these ideas through Darwin. Darwin seemed to have had Malthus's ideas about this struggle between population size and food supply. Darwin had these ideas in mind when he was doing his observations, for example, in the Galapagos Islands of the, of the different bird species, and coming up with what we now call Darwin's theory of evolution. So this was perhaps the only important historical incident in which an economist's view, an economist's writing, influenced the progress of natural science. In any case, the ideas of Malthus applied now not so much, uh, partially to human population and food, but also to pollution and to natural resource scarcity. 
came back into prominence in the 1960s and the 1970s. And I've written here the title of a book, Limits to Growth, which was written in 1972. Limits to Growth is called a Malthusian or Neo-Malthusian book. It was written by natural scientists who use a new tool called systems modeling where they used differential or difference equations uh, to model the next 150 years approximately of the Earth's food supply, human population, natural resource supply, food supply, and so forth. And then they put these equations into a computer, which was a pretty new tool at that time, and wrote a book about the, the resulting time paths of these variables which, which the computer simulated. And their idea was fairly pessimistic. They thought that by roughly the year 2030, the size of the human population would get too big, especially given a great increase in the amount of pollution and not sufficient increase in the amount of food supply. And that roughly between 2030 and 2050, there was going to be a collapse of the human population. There was going to be famine or increased diseases or deaths from pollution. And the rest of the 20th century would be pretty bad. So these are called Neo-Malthusian ideas. They're quite uh, pessimistic. The reaction of economists to the limits to growth, remember limits to growth was actually written by natural scientists, was mostly negative. There were some economists that uh, were and still are sympathetic with the limits to growth approach, but most economists were pretty unhappy. Uh, limits to growth doesn't have a price mechanism. And so in limits to growth, the use of something like copper, so copper use versus time, was assumed to be exponential not, I think, because of any particular understanding that it really would be exponential, but because the people who were writing this were natural scientists, and natural scientists often default to exponential growth. If you have exponential growth with something like uh, an exhaustible resource, what you then actually are predicting is increasing copper use until the point at which the copper gets exhausted, and then when the copper gets exhausted, you don't have any more copper and you have zero copper use from that point on. As we'll see towards the end of this chapter, economists thought this was quite unlikely. And one of the most important reasons is that economists know there is a price mechanism. And if you have increasing scarcity, the price mechanism would, the prices would get higher to indicate that increasing scarcity. And when prices got higher, copper use would fall, not rise. Now, we'll get into the details in the later part of this chapter, but the point is that economists really objected to the lack of a price mechanism, lack of any prices at all in the limits to growth model. And I think the neoclassical economists had a point there that the, neoclass that the limits to growth model was probably unrealistic in, in this way. The last Malthusian sort of idea I want to talk about is peak oil, although it's much, actually much less controversial than the other ideas. The first notion of peak oil time was the following. Suppose we plot U.S. oil production. A well-known geologist in the early 1960s predicted that U.S. oil production would look like this. And this would occur in the late 1960s. And he called this date the date of peak oil. So it wasn't when oil was going to run out, but it was when the U.S. production of oil was going to reach its peak. And at that point, on because of less oil supplies, U.S. oil production was going to fall. This and it and this prediction made in the early 1960s that in the late 1960s U.S. oil production would hit peak oil. That prediction turned out to be correct. 
at least people thought it was correct until around the year 2005. And this famous prediction then gave rise to this idea that you could describe oil production even for the entire world with this kind of curve. And then the question is, when would the, when would the what would be the date of peak oil for the entire world? And around the years 2005, 2006, 2007, just before the Great Recession, there are many people saying that this was the time of peak oil. The price of oil was quite high in those years. And the idea is that we are beginning to run out of oil. And from now on, the oil um, production was going to be lower because we were going to run out. Now, what actually happened instead is that the Great Recession hit and the demand for oil fell uh, qu quite a great deal. Um, it also turned out that the famous correct prediction that U.S. oil production would peak in the late 1960s turned out to be wrong. The actual pattern of U.S. oil production looks like this. So it went down for a while, but then it started to go up very sharply. And this was around the year 2000 when the technology of fracking was invented. Fracking is hydraulic fracturing. It's putting uh, liquids down into an oil well to literally crack the rock. And having cracked the rock, oil or natural gas can flow through the cracks and therefore you can s extract a lot more oil and natural gas than you could if there weren't any cracks in the rock. This has enabled U.S. oil production to increase more than it was in the late 1960s. So we now know that this famous correct prediction that peak oil would happen in the late 1960s actually was incorrect. Peak oil in the U.S. hasn't happened yet because of the invention of fracking technology. So that finishes our discussion of the Malthusians. We'll get to the next group, the Ricardians, in the next video.